All right, we're working our way through the book of Revelation. And uh, today we're going to go about halfway down in chapter 14. And the title of the message is The Harvest of the Earth. The Harvest of the Earth. And we get that primarily from uh, starting in verse 14 and 15. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud was uh, a one that sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Uh, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the, the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat in the cloud thrust in the sickle of the earth, and the earth was reaped. And then also over at verse 8, uh, I mean, starting in verse 18, we see kind of another uh, harvest where it talks about, uh, the sharp sickle, thrust in thy sharp sickle, gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And so uh, I'm just going to take that section of this, this passage here and point out uh, some things about this as it has to do with the harvest of the earth. Now, the harvest is something that comes up a lot in the Bible. Okay? In the Old Testament, there was the feast, uh, different harvest feasts and all that uh, that pictured certain things right but in the in the new testament jesus himself used the harvest a lot you know illustrations parables even uh, uh just observation as he would talk about these and so let's look at a few of those mark chapter 4 mark chapter 4 look at verse 26 <clears throat> And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. And of course, I don't know if you know this, a lot of times when the Bible talks about, or when the Bible talks about corn, Corn as we know it and we eat it today wasn't really around back then, but it's closely related, believe it or not, to wheat. All right, and so wheat as it grows up with the blade and then that fruit on there, which is called the kernel of the corn, is actually talking about the wheat corn. Okay, and uh, sometimes it's hard to remember that. I even get mixed up a lot of times. I'm talking about how they went into the cornfield and ate corn, and I'm thinking in my head like they plucked off an ear of corn. They didn't have that kind of corn around back then, okay? So a lot of times it's reference to, uh, to wheat. And you see that come up a lot. Look at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. And if, you, if you're not sure, because I have heard people be like, no, it says corn. And if it says corn, it means corn. There's a lot of verses in the Bible that prove that it's talking about the kernel of wheat, okay, as the corn. Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 37. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now most time when we talk about the harvest, we're, this is what we're thinking about. The harvest is, you know, the field is ripe in the harvest. Pray for laborers. You know, we, we need to go out and uh, reap the harvest. And I'll talk about that verse more here in a little bit. But now let's go to Matthew 13. And I'm just picking out three of them. There's a whole lot of other uses of this concept. But here's a popular parable in chapter 13, verse 16. Matthew 13, 16, uh, um, no, 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Okay, he's already uh, given this parable. Now he's going to explain it. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh that wicked one and catch catcheth away that which was sown in the heart. Uh, this is he which receives seed by the wayside. You, you remember this story. He's, he's talking about the different types of ground. In, the, in this parable, the seed is the word, he says. And as the seed scattered about, it goes on these different types of, of ground. And now he's explaining what that is. But that's the, that's the metaphor that he used, is this idea of a harvest. Okay, And now one parable that I'm going to focus on a little bit more in this sermon is closely related to, I think, where, our text, where we're going to get back to our text in Revelation 14. And that is the parable of the, 
uh, the wheat and the tares. Okay, Matthew 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Um, he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together unto the harvest, uh, unto the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, uh, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, so here's a parable that he told where this guy has a field of wheat, and the enemy comes and sows bad seed in there, and these tares grow up. Now, I don't remember the name of it, but from what I understand, uh, from those who would work around that, you know, that kind of a industry, and they are familiar with what grows, especially in that culture. I can't remember the name of it, but they, there's a type. What is it? Darnell. Darnell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a type of uh, seed that is very similar, looks very similar to uh, the wheat. Now, I would use this as an example. If you've ever been trying to grow grass, you know, you got. Because uh, that's probably what most of us, we're not farmers, <laughs> most of us probably, that's our, we're, we're more familiar with trying to grow grass seed and uh, get the lawn looking healthy or whatever. And have you ever had like crab grass or some kind of unwanted grass grows up? It's still grass, or maybe it's not, maybe it's a weed or whatever, but it's still filling in and looking green, but you're like, oh man, how do, how do I get rid of all these? I think it would be kind of a similar thing to that. And if you look at those, and I've, I've looked at illustrations of the Darnell and the, and the wheat, and they do grow up at the very beginning stage, and they look very, very similar, okay? And I preached a message once and explained this this way. In fact, it was a, I was preaching to young people, and I used uh, those little pool noodles. Have I explained that to you guys before? I used these pool noodles, okay? And, uh, and that was to represent, like, the stalk that would grow up, the blade, if you will. And then, uh, so I was explaining how, you know, these all grow up, and then this other one grows up, and it looks a lot like that. But on this one, I strapped uh, water balloons to it, and that represented the actual seed or the fruit, right? Well, when you, when you have two noodles, one has no water balloons, and one other one has water balloons, what do you think happens? One with the water balloon goes, right? So what I understand, at the end of the harvest, the difference between the, wheat, the actual wheat and the tares, okay? And so this is what I think is going on here. And he says, look, don't just start pulling up the what you think are tares, because you might accidentally pull up a lot of the wheat as well. Let it all grow up together. And in the harvest, we'll go ahead and separate the two. In other words, it wasn't going to hurt them. You know, it wasn't going to stop them from growing or whatever. They're just going to have to grow up together until the time of the harvest. And, of course, then they have to go in. And if all of the, uh, the good fruit of the wheat is kind of leaning, leaning over a little bit, and the others are standing up, it's a little easier to recognize what they are. So they go in and pull out all the bad stuff. And what is it good for? Nothing but to be cast in the fire, right? bundled up and burned. And so he takes that and he does that. So this is pretty much the illustration that we're talking about here. And I wanted you to see how that compares to uh, Revelation 14. And... What, what I'm going to have you do here is mark in your Bibles uh, or be ready somehow to, to look at Revelation. Uh, was, we'll need Matthew 24, obviously. <laughs> Matthew 24, Revelation 6, we'll go into 7, and then Revelation 14. And we're going to look at all these different areas. Now, once again, just a reminder that after chapter 12, we're kind of telling all the same story again. So you can expect to see a lot of repeats from like a slightly different perspective, but telling the same story uh, of the revelation that we already saw 
in chapter 1 through uh, through. 11. And so uh, we're going to compare those and then again compare that with Matthew 24. And I think it all comes clear what exactly is going on, all right? So this parable lines up well with what we see here in chapter 14, which lines up well with what we see in Matthew 24 and Matthew, I mean, in uh, Revelation 6. And so number one, the point I want to make here is that spiritually, spiritually speaking, the world is, re- is ripe unto harvest, okay? Uh, it's a huge job. If it, just think if the whole world is the wheat field, so to speak, and we're supposed to go out and just, you know, reap the harvest, all those that are ready to be saved, isn't that what we're looking for and praying for when we go out knocking doors? Lead us to the ones who are ready, the ones that are ready to uh, receive Christ and get saved. And it's our job to go find those and to preach the gospel and try to find those. Now, we're doing a whole lot of other things in the meantime, and there's discipleship and there's different things going on. But as far as this harvest is concerned, we are looking for people that are ripe unto harvest. And so spiritually speaking, we're trying to get people saved, not physically, right? Uh, They don't immediately go to heaven whenever they get saved. They're still on this earth, but spiritually speaking, we're, we're, we're helping them uh, uh, get to heaven. And so uh, spiritually, the world is ripe unto harvest. Okay, And it says, you know, every time somebody gets saved, we're te- technically harvesting them. And this is why we pray, Lord, send laborers, because uh, the, the laborers are few, right? And so and this is our, our mindset. We need more people to go out and to do that. And it says some will uh, bring a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold, right? There's going to be different amounts of people producing more fruit, if you will, seeing more souls saved. And we want to see as many reached as we can. So spiritually speaking, there is that uh, harvest, if you will, that we're already in. We're already trying to reap from that, that harvest, okay? But physically speaking, physically speaking, the day will come when there will be a harvest okay let's look at here first of all here's here's what we see in the book of revelation compared with uh, uh matthew 6 and uh Matt, i mean i'm sorry matthew 24 <clears throat> we see look for let's start with matthew well we'll do the cycle for all these points we'll start with matthew then we'll go to revelation 6 and then revelation 14 and i want you to see here number one we see the patience of the saints now this is what we talked about last sunday uh, the patience of the saints. And so Matthew 24, <clears throat> starting in verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. You see this clearly. That's the patience of the saints, right? Enduring these trials, enduring uh, persecution and everything. And so we see that. Uh, Now let's compare that to Matthew chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 6. Excuse me. Revelation chapter 6. Look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, doth thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for season look at this until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled okay you see the patience of the saints enduring these things being killed being persecuted 
and uh, going through all these hard times. That's the patience of the saints. Now look at Revelation chapter 14. Now it's interesting to note here that chapter 14 begins with uh, talking about the 144,000. Well, in chapter 6, at that same time, it's talking about the 144,000. Uh, it's the, the 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 timeline is the same. You see the 140 the persecution of the saints, 144,000, and then you see this uh, this talk about uh, the rapture that happened at the same time or the resurrection. Okay, so uh, Matthew 14. I keep saying Matthew, sorry. Revelation 14, look at verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that, uh, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Okay, the Lord's coming back, and He's going to reward those who have continued to labor and what have you. Even those who would labor unto death, He's saying, hey, blessed are those who die uh, from this time forward. And, it, and again, during that time, the timeline, what we see right there is right before the resurrection or the rapture is a severe persecution or the great tribulation of those days that is going to take place, and that's the patience of the saints as they're waiting. Like we saw in chapter 6, how long, Lord, before you, know, you avenge us? And so we see there that there is this patience of the saints. And then that's followed right after that by, what, a sign in the, in the, in the clouds, a sign in the sky, okay, in clouds. So look at Matthew 24 again. Matthew 24, look at verse 25. <clears throat> Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And look at this. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and shall see the Son of Man, look at this, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now let's compare that to Revelation. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 6, look at verse 12. All right, this is right after the last part I read about the, uh, about the patience of the saints, and this is where it picks up. Verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casting her untimely figs when she was shaken uh, of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And then that's where the part where it talks about basically people that are still here wondering what's going on. And they're trying to run from that, hide us, you know, keep us from the day of the wrath of the Lamb. All right, now let's compare that. It doesn't mention clouds, but you notice it talked about the signs in the sky, which is very similar to what we see in Matthew 24. Now, uh, yeah, Matthew 24. Now look at Revelation 14. Revelation 14. And verse 14. Again, this is the same thing. We just got done reading 13 about the persecution and the uh, uh, patience of the saints. Okay, verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. All right, so you see here, uh, the, this is uh, the, the events leading up to this harvest is what I'm getting at. And so we see the patience of the saints. 
We see Jesus in the clouds after the signs in the sky and what have you. And then finally we get to what we're calling for this in our text, the harvest. All right, so let's go to Matthew 24 again. These are the, these are the chain of events that are going to happen leading up to this final harvest, if you will. There are actually two harvests we'll get to in a minute. Matthew 24, look at verse 27. <clears throat> now, I already read this earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Talk as for as the God of the east and shineth even unto the west, shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. All right, and the Bible talks about in Second Thessalonians about the are gathered together with him and, and so the gathering or the catching away all those things is re reference to the rapture and here's what he says wherever the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together now that sounds interesting and a lot of people have tried to figure out what that means i've heard several uh, different uh, uh ideas of what that could mean but to me as i'm reading the sequences comparing it with revelation which we're going to see those comparisons what I see here is quite simply the carcass is a picture of Jesus in this situation. Now, he's not calling him a carcass. He's not dead. It's not the carcass sounds like a crude thing. But the idea is if you ever saw roadkill, which we've all seen <laughs> living in Kansas, you ever see roadkill, what happens? All the big scavenger type birds, wherever that carcass is, they go to it. Okay, so the so the idea is. You got the carcass and you got all the birds gathered together at that carcass, right? And here's what he's saying. Hey, when the rapture comes, you know, you got Jesus in the sky and everybody's going up to meet. Him. We're not going to eat his body like, <laughs> like, that pic like the picture you might see of this carcass. But look, the Bible uses that kind of, that kind of picture a, a lot. I mean, even you go to uh, John 6 where he's saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. And a lot of people are trying to take that literally like the Catholic Church, right? Well, we understand he's using that symbolically. And so the idea here is gathered together, right? And we're going to meet him. So what does he say? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. Look, all these uh, verses are lining up together saying the same thing. Okay, let's look at, look at it in Revelation now. Revelation 6, and look at verse 12. Revelation 6, verse 12. <clears throat> and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, uh, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven uh, de departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of its place. You're like, hey, didn't you just read that? No, I read it in, Ma in Matthew 24, <laughs> but it's talking about the same thing. Now look at Revelation 14. Hope you're keeping up. <laughs> Revelation 14, all right? This is our text for today. This is where we are. What I'm showing you that is this harvest here is reference to the resurrection or the rapture. Okay, and so here's what we have in uh, Revelation 14. Look at verse 15. Now again, let's start first back at 14. It says, I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one that sat uh, like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Here's the Son of God coming in the clouds. Right now, I don't want to get into all some people are like, no, no, no. In this place, he comes with clouds and here he comes on the cloud. And here it's cloud and here it's clouds. And look, it's all talking about the same thing. Jesus Christ, his return. He's in the clouds. We just saw the sun darkened and the moon like blood. And we see these signs and all this. And then we see Jesus in the clouds. It's all talking about the same thing. All right. But this time it explains it this way, that when he comes in the clouds, somehow the revelation is given to John. And he sees this image. Now, I say I usually try to take everything literally uh, unless it seems to force kind of a, a symbolic meaning here. 
Well, here it seems to me, my first thought would be there must be some symbolism here where he comes in and he's reaping this harvest because I don't think Jesus is really coming back to get some weed and to get some grapes, right? So we're, we understand he's talking about a symbolism here and he's coming for the harvest and it says he has a sickle in his hand. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever used a sickle. Uh, that must have been some rough work back in the day to mow your yard or something like that with a, with a sickle. Uh, you know what a sickle is? just like a... Uh, it's like a big stick with a with a big long blade on the end. You could use that to take down that wheat, or whatever, or or mow your mow your yard. I remember, uh, man. Now this is gonna date me a little bit, but I remember Y two K. All right, year, the year two thousand came around. Everybody thought we're gonna be without power. You know, look, I don't know how computers work, but I, I would think. Like if people really knew what they were talking about, they would have known that this wasn't <laughs> really going to be a thing. But all over the media was saying, oh, the world's coming to an end and everything's going to shut down and we're going to go into famine and nobody's going to be able to. And the, ga the, the price of gas shot way up and all this. Uh, so people were coming up with all these ideas. Hey, make sure you stock up on, hey, nothing's new under the sun. Toilet paper and all this kind of stuff. And stock up on extra food and water and all this because you're not going to be able to get it. Who knows how long it'll be before computers start working again. This was the idea. None of that really happened that I'm aware of. Okay, But I remember uh, uh, they started selling all these new gadgets. And, uh, and I remember this kid coming to me and saying, Hey, did you, ever, did you see those new lawnmowers that are like, they don't take gas? And basically what it is is you just push it and there's the blade that goes around and it cuts the grass. And he was like, that's so cool. Such a neat invention. And I'm like, I mowed with one of those when I was a little bitty kid just because we didn't have another lawnmower. That was, the, that was the fancy way of doing it back then, right? Which was an upgrade from cutting it down <laughs> with a, with a uh, what's that thing called? Sickle, thank you. And so the, that, that's rough work, okay, is what I'm saying. But that's the, t the instrument that he's talking about. That's the tool where it comes in with a sharp blade and you can kind of reap stuff from down low. And, 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 and cut that off. So you got, you know, here's the Son of Man in the clouds. And then it says that he, uh, he has, uh, uh, let's see here, verse, let's start with verse 14. It says, in his hand is a sharp sickle. Verse 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat. Thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Okay, so this is the harvest, if you will. Now, physically, yes, there is a harvest that we're talking about where the Lord comes and he takes out his people, uh, you know, and he gathers up um, the good seed, if you will, and then those tares are still remaining and so uh, but s there's also a, another harvest if you will that is the harvest of God's wrath look at verse 18 another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud uh, cry to him that had a sharp sickle saying thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe we're talking about gathering uh, uh, grapes now, maybe a little bit different, but the idea here, uh, as you can see real closely, is the picture that you get of the uh, his wrath being poured out. Now, I remember there was a an old book or a play or something we were supposed to read in school. I guess I didn't ever do it, but it's called The Grapes of Wrath. And I guess they get that picture from here. I really don't know because I never <laughs> read the book. But the phrase Grapes of Wrath isn't used. But the idea of what you do with the, with the, the grapes, okay, and the picture, obviously, the grapes is tied in real closely with blood. And what you do with grapes is, is, is they would put it in. Some people still do this to this day uh, to make their grape juice or their wine. They'll put uh, all these grapes into these big uh, containers or vats. And then people will literally get in there with their feet that I hope are clean. And they'll squash up and down on that grape till all that juice comes out and runs out some kind of little filter or something like that. And they have fresh juice okay and so this is the picture that he's talking about and in verse 20 he says in the wine press did i read verse 19 and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of god and the wine press was trodden without the city 
and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles. Think about how big a horse is and the bridle what's in their mouth, right? To the horse's bridle uh, by a space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. We're talking about a lot of grape juice, right? Which is representing blood. And anytime you see and whether you're reading Ezekiel or uh, any of the other prophecies in there or, or even here in Revelation, and you're talking about basically a bloodbath, you know, that this war is going to involve a lot of death, a lot of blood. And, uh, and so this is God's wrath, which we understand God's wrath comes at what point in the timeline? Right after the rapture is God's wrath poured out upon the earth. And so this is what we see to harvest, if you will. Now, in the parable of the wheat and the harvest, here's an interesting little twist on the story. In the parable of the wheat and the harvest, what he says is, because you remember the wheat, I said once it's full of the fruit that's on there, the wheat drops down a little bit, the tear's a little bit easier to find. So when you read that story, what he's really doing is he's gathering up all the uh, the tears, the bad stuff first, and then he and he's going to burn it up and all that kind of stuff. And you say, well, okay, well that's not the same as what goes on in the book of Revelation, because in the book of Revelation he first takes up the the saints, right, and then he pours out his wrath upon uh, upon the earth. But if you think about it, it's only a temporary reaping. Right, that we're going to do with the rapture. In fact, the 144,000, they're still here during that time. And so this reaping that's going on, the primary idea of taking the saints out and about sealing the 144,000 in their foreheads and all that is, is because what he's first focusing on is I'm going to destroy what's left on this earth. Of all those who persecuted the saints and all those who lived contrary to God and rejected Christ, and all those, and he's going to pour out his wrath. This is that first harvest, just like those tares that he takes up and he burns and he gets rid of. He's going to do similarly where he's going to pour out his wrath upon these. And so he uses the picture of the grapes instead of the wheat because it's a great picture of, of just the bloodshed and, and, and uh, the horrific things that are going to happen during that time. And then what happens, we're going to come back to the millennial kingdom and then the focus now is on the wheat. Okay, It's kind of like putting the wheat into the barns at that point. All right, so here's the deal. I love reading Revelation. I love studying it. There's a lot going on. It's talking about the wrath of God. It's talking about all these things that are going to happen in the end times. And it's great. We should read it. We should heed it. We should learn from it and understand it, be able to explain it to people and all those kinds of things, compare Scripture with Scripture. All those things are great. But at the end of the day, we need to let God deal with the physical harvest in the end times. Okay, we got to let God deal with the judgment. Let God deal with pouring out of His wrath. Let God deal with all those kinds of things. Let Him deal with the uh, the the gathering up of the saints. Yeah. We just got to be patient until that day and endure whatever does come. Hopefully, it's not going to be much in our lifetimes. But if it does, if we see the last days and the rise of the Antichrist sitting in the temple and we see all these things come to pass. Well, I think that'd be time to get excited because you know uh, that any day he's the Lord's coming back. And so uh, so we uh, don't need to worry about that. Let God deal with the physical harvest in the end. But what he's called us to do has to do with that spiritual harvest. OK, what we need to be focused on is that harvest where he says, hey, the fields are ripe already unto harvest. OK. What we're worried about is getting those people who are ready to be saved, getting them the gospel, letting them know. And this morning in, uh, in Iola, I was preaching from Luke 17, and I was talking about how uh, uh, the guys, uh, uh, the lepers, you know, the 10 lepers, and only one of them came back to thank, to thank God. And so one of the points I drew from that, uh, that chapter there is in order for anybody to get saved, the first thing they need to do, this is obvious, is they need to hear about who Jesus is. They need to hear of his power and that he's available to help and all that. And I'll, I won't re-preach that message. And so what we need to focus on, obviously, when it comes to the harvest, is just making sure that that seed is being scattered 
and that the, those who are ripe already in the harvest are being plucked out of the, uh, the fire, if you will. And we need to focus on the spir- spiritual harvest. We need to bear fruit, lay up treasures in heaven, and do all those things. It's fun to read Revelations. It's fun to think about uh, a God uh, going to do all these things and how he's going to avenge the evildoers and all that. But you know what? We just need to try to stay focused on the spiritual aspect while we're here waiting for these things to happen. All right. Well, that was kind of a little bit of a difficult one to preach. Okay, there's, I know there's a lot, lot to go there back and forth between the three different places. But uh, I hope it made some sense to you. And we're moving along a little bit farther through the book of Revelation. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've saved us. Thank you that we are not uh, appointed under wrath, but we understand that the uh, uh, that we will one day be gathered together uh, to sit at your table and to be uh, rewarded for the good things that we've done on this earth. I pray that you'll help us to live a life that is uh, that demonstrates our faith in these things and in your word and a life that demonstrates uh, uh, a desire to bear fruit for you and to lay up treasures in heaven. And we do acknowledge the things that are going to happen. We look forward to the events as they take place. But I pray you just help us to be busy in the harvest. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.